This is Criteria. Hey everyone, welcome back to Criteria. I'm Thomas Miras. I'm here with my co-host James Majewski. Hello, James. Hey, Thomas. And uh, we are doing our first classic film discussion since finishing the Vatican film list. We had a couple of a uh, couple of reviews of new films in there, but now we're going back to uh, some older material. Not, not that much older, almost right. twenty and, years and it, though. And it should be noted our our first you know classic discussion, not classic film discussion like uh we're, we're not talking about a classic film oh we're not it, it, oh so you think apocalypto is a classic that's what i meant that's what i meant oh um, okay okay anything okay. that's not I, I just meant something that's not recent that we think is good <laughs> i see, I, see. Um, I guess i guess i'm still living in this world where i'm not as old as i am <laughs> apocalypto is still a recent film <laughs> right yeah 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 so oh, yeah gee. Uh, yeah, so we are talking about uh, Mel Gibson's movie from 2006, Apocalypto, and I kind of got fixated on this film as I wanted this to be the first thing that we discussed after completing the Vatican film I know, film it was list. a weird fixation. Um, I think it's just because I wanted something that seemed like more modern with action in it and, yeah. uh, and also... Yeah, it, it, it had been really hyped up. You and others really, really hyped this film up to me. I'm glad to say that it lived up to my expectations. Now, none of us um, put it on our on our list for a film to be added to the Vatican film list no. since 1995. Yeah, I think I think that uh, maybe I was a little prejudiced not to consider it because I knew that we were going to be talking about the film. Right. Um, but now that I think about it, I think that this is a great contender for a film since 95 that could easily go on the list. I guess Mm. the reason it doesn't is because you're already getting a Mel Gibson film with the passion. Yeah. That's the obvious uh, choice to put on the list. Yeah. But I think, I think a strong case can be made um, for, uh, for Apocalypto as a, well, a masterpiece in its own right. I mean, I think Mm. that you could argue that it is a better film than the passion, even if it's not necessarily a more sublime film or, you know, profound work of art. I think that there's a lot um, cinematically going on in Apocalypto that is actually a development of things that are, you know, definitely present and well executed in the past. Interesting. But, you know, I think that you get it, you get the sense with Apocalypto of a director who's really beginning to hit his stride with the kind of stuff that he's interested in doing. How many films had he made before the passion? uh, That's a good question. Um, because the only yeah. ones I've seen are Apocalypto, The Passion, and Braveheart. And right. I don't know how many there are actually. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm not sure m- myself either. Um, but you know, uh, I think it's it's unfortunate because Apocalypto also sort of coincided with Mel Gibson's fall from grace. <laughs> right. Uh, so it came and, two years after The Passion. Yeah. People were already, you know, some people were already coming after him. You know, right. at, at that point, and then it came six. It came out. Six months after his DUI, where he said the Jews were responsible for all the wars in the world. And it got plenty of good reviews, but it's got a 65% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is well, kind of mediocre. Yeah, I mean, and, you, you've got a lot of things going on. You've got, yes, people coming at him for the passion. You've got the scandals, because there was also, I don't know if you remember, release of his like voicemails or something where he was being But really did, had that happened yet? Or was that, uh, I thought that was later. Maybe, maybe. But yeah. in any case, but the DUI already, was that year. Yeah. And then um, there's also the fact that thematically it's dealing with issues of, you know, yeah. uh, first peoples and colonialism. Yes, and, and, totally. Uh, and, and this was, this was, Again, not so much the zeitgeist of the cultural conversation back in 2005 as it is, you know, now, um, but still definitely a hot topic and still one where you could just condemn a film for just not towing the right, the right, you know, ideological line. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, to give credit to cre- where credit is due, you know, uh, Mel Gibson is hated by a lot of people, certainly a lot of film critics. But yet, you know, Hacksaw Ridge did well. Hacksaw Ridge didn't win an Oscar, you know, um, and uh, Apocalypto, like I said, middling, not as good as they would be, I'm sure, the reviews if he wasn't hated yeah. for other reasons. But, um, but, but 
Hacksaw Ridge, it's just important to note. I mean, there's like more than a decade in right. between those two right. films. Yeah. And or or maybe just a decade. Um and I think that what I was what I was getting at was that Apocalypto, it's 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 a really great film, but it's also it, it makes me sad when I watch it because it it sort of suggests to me all of the work that Mel Gibson could have been doing in that in that period of 10 years or so in between um you know apocalypto and then the success of hacksaw ridge because he really needed to be rehabilitated he had a few uh projects i don't know that he had any directorial work uh yeah in that time um but he no, was definitely so. blacklisted and yes and you don't get anything near approaching the kind of excellence of apocalypto until hacksaw ridge but i think by then he's a different uh artist you know he's a different director he he's got there's there's some some important differences between apocalypto and then you know what what happens afterward and so right, i think that right. it's just it's just such a bummer because i think he's one of the greatest uh certainly american uh film directors of our time you know with with the passion and then with apocalypto you just have this this actor who, or this actor director who is just pumping him out at his prime, right. you know, and, yeah. and really finessing a, an aesthetic, uh, that is, is, is uniquely his own, um, really sort of zeroing in on the kinds of stories that he wants to tell and the, the, the things that he's bringing to the screen, um, in, in some cases for the first time, um, you know, like yeah. cer certainly this film, there's not really many, there's really not really much precedent for something like it. Um, right. and then, and then with the passion, you know, I think that we can agree that that is also a singular achievement. Yeah. Of, but, you know, and, it's that it just feels also like that was coming cut from, short. Yes, totally. Yeah. But also, I mean, the tragedy of his his personal, right. <laughs> you know, problems totally, is totally. even greater. And, you know, you, you, you could say, oh, yeah, liberal Hollywood doesn't like Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson would have probably hurt his career just as much and even more if he had done these these things in the 40s. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right. Um, but, you know, as an artist, yes, we are <laughs> wishing for more, uh, more great work like this. Um, yeah. And uh, but I will say, you know, as much as maybe that the, the this this film is not remembered as much as it deserves in itself um, for the, for some of these reasons, uh, this film has a very good reputation among, you know, film film directors. Um, and, and a lot of, a lot of the people on the artistic side, as opposed to the critical side in Hollywood have praised this film to the skies. I mean, Robert Duvall praised this film very highly. Quentin Tarantino, of course, you can imagine loved this film. Martin Scorsese said this was just an, an incredible accomplishment. Uh, another great actor at, at Edward James, almost Edgar Wright. Um, uh. and, uh, Spike Lee, who you might not expect, Spike Lee yeah. put this on his list of essential films for uh, directors to study. Um, so I think that's really cool that this film got you know so much credit from from people as an an outstanding you know great piece of modern cinema. Um, so yeah, and I I think it is it is a really really unique film. It's cool, you know. It's so cool with Mel Gibson that he does really seem to do. Uh, just what he wants to do <laughs> when he's making his films. I mean, he did these two films in a row that are both in languages that most people have never heard. Yet there's this also this very accessible sensibility that he brings to his films. Right. I mean, right. there's action. There's I mean, it's a chase movie, you know, yeah. at its core. This is yeah. a, a film directed by the man who starred in <laughs> the Mad Max films, you know? Um, and in fact, uh, Edgar Wright, when he praised this film, he said this would make a great uh, double double feature with Mad Max Fury Road oh, as two cool. kind of like modern masterpieces of cinema. Totally. Yeah, that's um, great. Yeah. Well, maybe, so, maybe we should give a quick synopsis of what the totally. film is about. Yeah. Um, so uh, the film takes place in, uh, you know, some, uh, so, so, I guess it's South America. Where this is the Mayan people, I think. Yeah. Uh, not the Aztecs. That's right. Um, and uh, it follows uh, the story of, of uh, a young, you know, tribesman. Uh, he's living with his community in the, in the forest when they're attacked by the Maya uh, on one of these raids to round up people for the purpose of human sacrifice. 
And so he's brought to this Mayan city where uh, he manages to escape. And um, and so it's a chase film uh, really for like the second half of it. The first yeah. half of it is sort of all a lead up to um, to this dramatic escape. Right. And then the rest of it is um, is him not just getting back to his wife and his child who are trapped in sort of a, a cave or a cistern uh, where their village was raided. Um, but also to sort of, uh, you know, get get his uh, his payback. Uh, it's not a revenge film, but no. it is one of these turns where the hunted becomes the hunter, um, which is, right. you know, very satisfying uh, cinematically. Um, but the, the emphasis is not on revenge. It's definitely on, you know, he's he's protecting himself. He's protecting his land um, and ultimately he's protecting his family. Um, so so, you know, you can feel morally uh, uh, good about it. Um, but uh but yeah, it's, it's an ex- it, if I can jump on that not a revenge film thing. I mean, yeah. one thing I noticed the main actor, um, a lot of the actors in this film are not. Most of them are not professionals. Um, right. uh, I don't know if Rudy Youngblood, who who played the the main character, had done any roles before that, um, but he has a really remarkable face and these big eyes. And um, one thing I noticed is there's a number of moments where something really horrible is done to him or to somebody he cares about and the 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 character who's kind of his his nemesis in this film and Rudy uh Youngblood the actor who plays Jaguar Paw the main character yeah. looks into the guy's eyes but he's just kind of like staring and it's not like this look of hatred it's just it's like I don't know how you would describe it, but it's almost like he's processing. He has this look of wonder on his face at a number of moments in, in, totally. in the movie. Totally. And um, it's funny because the only time he gets like a super reveling in action or reveling in combat look on his face is the the moments when he's playing a prank on his fellow tribe tri- <laughs> at the beginning of the movie. But when he's actually fighting his enemies, you don't see these like spiteful glances or you know right. reveling in defeating them or anything like that it's really yeah. just all about getting back to his family um and it's also interesting because um to a certain extent he the, these characters from this tribe are uh not not that they're just presented as sort of like noble savages but they but they are sort of the innocents who are out there in the woods and they're brought into this corrupt mayan Right, urban environment, and so I think that his casting and just his overall face and his his demeanor lend themselves well to uh, processing this experience of seeing a city a city for the first time and sure. like gradually realizing that you're being brought to be sacrificed. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and all all of these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's definitely there definitely is a nobility to his character to the 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 tribe that he's coming from mm-hmm. and i think that part of it is that the film's interest the way i view the film is as a kind of uh portrait of a culture of death and con- contrasting that with a culture of life right um so this is an, an expression that Certainly, Mel Gibson would have been uh, familiar with probably uh, as a Catholic. We talk about a culture of death nowadays in relation to abortion, euthanasia, sometimes with reference to capital punishment. Um, although you know that's not nearly anywhere near the, the same thing. Um, uh, but um, but but it's it's definitely there have been cultures of death before. Um, and and we live in a in a great one nowadays with with uh uh you know legal abortion uh yeah. in many states but but when your society is built on an institution like human sacrifice especially at a large scale you can properly begin to talk about a culture of death there and so i think that that's something that mel gibson right. is interested in examining in illustrating and so uh it's it's a helpful contrast to sort of paint another picture of what um what it looks like when 
um, a community is is functioning properly. Um, right. But you know, there are people who speak that they're not quite part of the same culture, but they're people who speak the same language. They're not so different that he's showing, right. you know, the Europeans coming right. in, which is a right. topic we'll get to as yeah. being the exemplars of the culture but of life. There's there's precedent for this. You know, I, I know more about uh, the history with the Aztec than I do with the Maya. But I know that in the case of the Aztec, there really there was this sort of like, you know, years long sort of constant warfare on right other on their own people um to to basically and other tribes yeah yeah you know using weapons that weren't meant to kill but instead to maim and to to take hostage to get these prisoners to bring back for the purpose of this sort of never ending uh uh cycle of human sacrifice right. um, and we should and, mention the quote at the beginning of the the film right yes very cool very evocative um do you remember it's will, it? will it's will durant this historian um, and I don't have the quote in front of me, but it's basically a civilization is never destroyed until it first, you know, it's never conquered from, from without ah, until you. it destroys itself from within or something right. like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, of course, famously, the Maya and the Aztec were were conquered. Uh, spoiler alert. Right. Um, but we don't really get to that um, in the film, although it exists as a sort of it's it's put there right up uh, uh, at the front with this opening um, right. quote. It's it's sort of placed there as a kind of ominous threat that's yeah. lurking. This is a this is a civilization that has an expiration date, and right. um, they're almost aware of it. You know, we get references to um, the time of their lament is what we hear the the the, the as a Mayan priest uh, talk about with uh, plague. Um, uh, you know, sort of uh, decadence in the city. We um, see their, we see the dis devastation that they've wrought on the areas outlying the city. There's sort of an ecological theme exactly, in the film exactly. with, the story, with the story that the old man uh, in the the tribe in the woods uh, tells about, you know, man's endless thirst to, you know, rob the goods right. of the earth until the earth right. dies. Right. So again, you know, that's, it's, it's all sort of contrasted with the introduction that we're given to uh, this, this, uh, this other tribe um, and the way that they're interacting with the land, this forest that they inhabit, that they know so well, that they're hunting, they're sharing with one another, the camaraderie, um, the pranking, but also the ability to take a joke, um, mm -hmm. uh, importantly, um, uh, the closeness. But then I think also another big way that this is illustrated is in the relationship between father and son. So uh, Jaguar Paw, he's hunting with his father, who is kind of uh, one of these leaders in the community. Um, and uh, the actor who plays him, again, has a kind of similar uh, uh, sort of uh, steadiness in his expression. You know, it, this is probably something that's natural in these two actors that we're talking about, but it's also probably something that Mel Gibson, as an actor himself, is directing, you know, and, and trying to sort of uh, uh, get out of these performances. Um, because a big theme is is how fear operates on people and how it, it rots um, and, and spreads. Uh, and so the father, Jaguar Paw's father, you know, sort of cautions him against this. And and in the performance that this actor gives, he really exudes a kind of confidence, a, a, a courage, uh, a, a a piece right. um, that we see Jaguar Paw kind of claim for his own. He struggles with it a little bit at the beginning, but then during the course of the film, it's really um, it's also him taking up this mantle of 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 courage, um, of not succumbing to fear. Um, uh, the 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 fear theme is introduced at the beginning when we see uh, another tribe uh, that sort of has already been ravaged is now sort of uh, passing through the forest looking for a new a new home to seek a new beginning they say, um, but the the theme of fear comes up again importantly when we reach the Mayan uh, uh, city uh, where there is a, there's a plague going around and these these warriors who we've seen you know. Uh, acting all mighty and tough are very afraid of a little girl who has this, this sickness. Right. Um, and so fear and, and uh, the description of fear as a sickness is another important theme in the right. film. Um, but I also, I, I was getting off, I kind of veered off of my main point, which was to say that, uh, that the relationship of father and son is another important way in which uh, culture is evoked um, yes. because there's another father and son and that's the father 
uh, who is the leader of this hunting party uh, that's that's going around and, and rounding up people for the purposes of of sacrifice. His son is with him on this, um, and the interactions between the two of them are, are are a really stark contrast to the interactions between mm-hmm. Jaguar Paw and, and his father. But we, then we get to really see how these sins um, are are inherited how they're passed on right and uh you know and how they become sort of cemented in the culture early on um this this uh this this villain this uh he i guess he is he is one of the main villains he's the leader of this uh this group that is uh ransacked right. jack zero Paul's wolf. village what's his name zero wolf zero wolf yeah well um he uh he gifts his son a, a dagger of his that has taken many lives. And so you see sort right. of symbolically in this, uh, the, Whereas the, the gift the other father gives to his son is the advice, about, the exactly. good advice about not giving it to fear. Exactly. But you see symbolically how this culture of death is passed on from one father to the next and how those who live by the sword will die by the sword uh, right. because both the father and his son uh, end up dead by the end of the, the film. Right. Um, so, so yeah, so there's a lot of really cool stuff going on thematically in the film, and it's amazing that uh, that Mel Gibson is able to weave all of that not just into a film that takes a very interesting historical period and and uh, with a lot of uh, historical rigor, but also you know cinematic and artistic uh, right. license and 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 uh, you know accessibility renders that on the screen in a film that ends up also being very entertaining, very right. exciting, at times very uh uh humorous. There's a lot of comedy, um, but then also uh very touching. It's a very humane film, you know, it's yeah. it's a film that that has to do with themes that go well beyond just, you know, human sacrifice or whatever. And and it speaks to things about motherhood, fatherhood, um again community um the it's uh it, it's a, it's a really really excellent excellent film yeah you were talking about the the aztecs and the maya and this film has taken some criticism from scholars in in you know uh ethnography or whatever you might want to call it scholars of the mayan civilization um some some people have said that the prevalence of human sacrifice or the scale of it that's depicted is more typical of the Aztecs than of the Maya. Um, other people wanted to really deny that this was happening at all. Um, but uh, the historical consultant on the film, Richard Hansen, wrote an essay, which I'll link people to, responding to some of these criticisms and displaying the research that went into the film. One thing that he mentioned is that this is this film is set, we should say, what, I think in the 1500s or maybe the 1400s, I forget exactly when, but it's basically right before the first contact with the Spanish, not before the conquistadors, because that's a little bit later, but just before the first contact with the Spanish. And um, this was a period when the Aztecs were actually really dominant, um, but the their cultural influence was spreading for just that reason. And so th- there's there's reason to believe that Mayans in certain regions were taking on some of the, the Aztec practices more. But what's interesting is the reason that they chose to make the Mayans the subject of the film rather than the Aztecs. The co-writer of this film, Farhad Safinia, who was originally some kind of, I think, production assistant on The Passion, and then he and Mel had this idea for this film. Um, he said that they the Mayans were far more interesting because – you could choose a civilization that's bloodthirsty, but but they wanted to show the Mayan civilization as sophisticated as it was because of their knowledge of medicine, science, astronomy in particular is displayed in this film, the archaeology and the engineering, but also to be able to show the the brutal brutality and the ritual savagery, as he puts it. Um, they wanted to be able to explore both of those things in tandem. Yeah. Um, and have well, that civilization. And it's, it's pretty clear from comments that Mel Gibson has made that he's very interested in not pointing the finger at the Maya, but but exploring this kind of as symbolic of civilizational problems 
today, right. including in the United States. I mean, right. he's even talking about things like the, you know, <laughs> the the Iraq, the decision to invade Iraq and things like that in interviews. So sure. Yeah, well, and I think that that's clear because <clears throat> what you have in uh, the depiction of, of Mayan culture here is a depiction of, on the one hand, great sophistication and, and advancement. Right. And then on the other hand, just deprav depraved brutality. And I think that's, in, you know, that's what, what we have today uh, throughout the West um, is that your, your sophistication can't be mask it can't be a screen for this this depraved brutality um and so what what what's the screen the screen is how it sort of insidiously works its way into your culture and becomes like just part of the air that you breathe um one of the things that i we, we've already touched on this a little bit by talking about the expressions in the actors faces um but one of the things that i like so much about this film is it's uh, it's it's cinematic eloquence, how it conveys so much in what it shows and not just in what it puts into people's mouths. Although the writing, it should be said, is really great. Mm -hmm. um, so so I, I like, I always, I always, you know, will privilege film as a visual medium. And so it's always, to me, in general, better when things can be shown. Uh, so you know, if we, we've already talked about how what's conveyed in looks, you see it a lot in the looks between Jaguar Paw and his father, or like you were saying, the looks between Jaguar Paw and this nemesis um, who's who's looking to get a reaction from him as he's doing these terrible things. Right. But what he what he's met with instead is this gaze of of uh, well, you know, who knows? Um, but uh, uh. You know, we talked about symbols um, like the dagger uh, that's given from the father to the son. Um, but then there's also gestures. One of the things that I like about uh, uh, Mel Gibson is that despite his commitment to a certain aesthetic realism, he's not limited by that. And so he's very, he's very comfortable veering into uh, gestures that are a little more stylized. Um, so for instance, uh, you get in in Apocalypto, as you do in The Passion, sequences that are more sort of mythic or spiritual uh, in their significance. There, early on, there's a dream that Jaguar Paw has mm. of uh, this man that he's encountered in the forest running away, um, and he's he's holding his heart, uh, you know, out to to Jaguar Paw. But before we see that, we just see him breathing really heavily, you right. know, wide eyed, and his mouth is open really wide, and and he's breathing really heavily, and that's that's a gesture or an action that I think is very it's very stylized, but it's very evocative, you right. know. Um, and then also uh, descriptive action. So when uh, when things are shown and and sort of convey uh, very efficiently and very eloquently a lot in a very condensed uh, uh, you know visual. So for instance, uh, when Jaguar Paw is being led away in captivity, uh, he looks toward this cave where his wife and uh, son have been hidden, and he sees the 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 rope the end of the rope that's been cut and that he, that he's left there for them to escape to get out of later slowly be pulled and then fall over the edge mm -hmm. and so it's like you see uh the the fuse go out or or, right. or time is the the thread of fate has been cut or you know it, it's just it's just such an eloquent yeah i mean visual. you see him uh, you almost see him imagining their response yeah, in uh, like how they're how they're responding and the despair but it's like the that film the film doesn't need them. to give you anything more than that you right. know so so even though the film will return to these characters throughout uh, in that moment that's all that we need to see as an audience right. to just yeah. feel the the immensity of that so these these are marks of an expert visual storyteller you know yeah. um and and you really get that throughout. Uh, yeah, there's just there's a lot of faces, especially in that scene oh when they gosh. first meet the other the other tribe that's yes. fleeing. Yes. Um, and uh, it's just very eerie with the music and a lot of interesting cuts to different faces and yeah. uh, well, kind of unnerving. And then then later you get a lot of faces in the 
scene where they're being led towards the city, another yeah. amazing tour de force scene because they built this massive Mayan city set, but then they also had all of these extras painted and all this makeup uh, just showing the scarification and all of these, you know, na- some the, the rich ladies with the blue en- enamel on their teeth and all of this crazy stuff. Uh, but you're getting all these people staring at them and interacting with them in various ways and smearing paint on them. And it feels like, I mean, it's very, very much a passion like sequence because sure. they're going to their doom, you know, surrounded yeah. by all the people jeering at them or whatever, you know, is is kind of spectacle is happening. Um but yeah, yeah, there's just a lot of powerful face stuff in the film. Well that and that sequence is it really is amazing because you would think uh if you were a director tasked with uh you know the problem of of creating a world uh that is now extinct. Um you know and 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 really uh you, what you you see a lot of a lot of uh, film directors take different stabs at this, and and some of them might your first instinct might be to create a massive set and get a lot of wide shots and populate it with a lot of like you know CGI activity and different things or whatever, um you know maybe throw in like some big set pieces some spectacle uh, stuff, but what does Mel Gibson do? He brings the focus in really close, so what we get is a bunch of close-up shots of these different characters. Each one is given, like, its own little, like, uh, two- to three-second vignette, if that even. But And yet, so much is conveyed um, through, yeah. like you said, uh, the, the costuming. Um, you know, we get the, the sense of different classes, classes um, the, the stratification of the soci- soci- society, um, uh, but also uh, in what they're doing. The tasks that they're doing, the kinds of uh, 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 industry that they're employed in, um, yeah, uh, or certain gestures of how they're interacting with one another. Um, so we see one of these rich women uh, uh, like spit into uh, the the panhandling of of a, of a bag header, a bag of a beggar, um, uh, you know, and sort of laugh as she brushes him off. And so the mm. callousness in that, um, or uh, you know, you know, other, other, other similar things, and and this is all building the world. It's telling us a lot about this society. This society. I don't know why I'm having such a hard time with that word today, um, and it's doing so, you know, more more eloquently, more directly, and efficiently than than, and probably more cost effectively uh, than uh, than, and also more believably than if you were to, you know build the largest possible set you could imagine. Now, don't get me wrong, it's an impressive set, um, but he's not abusing it, you know, and he's he's populating it. He's populating it with individuals. Right. And so it's also in the in the expressions and in the performances um, that this human thing is is conveyed. And and I think that's super important when you're talking about uh, a a culture like this, um, because you don't want to dehumanize, right? You want to convey the humanity of these people and so its applicability to me um and the warning that it holds for me and the society that i inhabit um it actually feels very familiar as as exotic as the face paint and the scarification and things are um just the different types of people you see there i mean the guy when he get when he's you know uh, the guy with the laughing sickness is coming up and grabbing um, Dragwar Pra as he's being led through the city. It's like, wow, this just feels like my neighborhood in Harlem, <laughs> in totally. Harlem you totally. know, or, yeah. or, you know, the, yeah, the people with their, with their bling and the things on their teeth. I mean, it's like, I yeah. see that all the time. Sure. <laughs> you know? For sure. For sure. Yeah. yeah. But you also get stuff about their religion, you know, in sort of uh, the dancing or the chanting. Um, you get things about their politics uh, with the, uh, the sort of, you know, I, I guess like the king and the queen that are up yeah. there and, the, and, the, and, and also like the clear, uh, as you move further and further into the city, how people become wealthier, more right. noble or extravagant or whatever. Um, and and I just love that the camera doesn't really open up until right. they get to the pyramids, you right. know, and you see the sacrifice going on in the distance. Um, right. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So it's it's just it's a very it's a it's it's a it's an almost counterintuitive way of building the world. Uh, yeah. But it's a very effective one. And again, I think it's just a mark of 
uh, Gibson of his yeah. of his sort of genius as a filmmaker. You know, another place where he conveys conveys a lot with just faces is uh the where when we see the manipulation of the people because the the because of the elites in the society know about astronomy they can predict when an eclipse is going to happen and so they use this to show the gods you know approval of the sacrifices that they're doing and things like that because then this this eclipse happens um and uh you know we it's pretty clear what's going on but you know what what we get to convey that is not any uh kind of dialogue between the people the 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 priests and the king you know conspiring but just these kind of looks and these nods and kind of like okay this is this is all happening as planned kind of you know it's yeah, it's right, all right, handled right. pretty in a very restrained sure. way sure um yeah you know that sequence also uh to me it just reminded me of of the pandemic i'm sorry if i if i can just like talk about this for a moment um uh it just reminded me of of the fear response with the fearful people and then the almost like immediate switch back into complacency. Right. So like the people are afraid when they see the eclipse, but then they're lulled almost immediately back into complacence and just sort of like, you know, having a party like nothing had happened, you know, like there right. hadn't been this like great sign in the sky. Right. And so I think about, you know, the the occurrences of the past few years and just how fearful people were and how much it led to bad policy um uh and 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 even even just aside from that just like bad juju among people um uh you <laughs> right. know just meanness um uh but then also how quickly you know we're we're sort of reassured just back into uh you know do, do you do we really get the sense that culturally anything really changed or any any sort of new new courage was found or, or um, challenge of overcome, you know? And so I mm -hmm. think that that's, that there's an interesting commentary on the dynamics of fear there and how fear is yeah. placated. Um, yeah. yeah. You were talking about uh, things, you know, developed in his filmmaking style from the passion. Uh, did you have also in mind slow motion, his use of slow motion for a dramatic effect? No, I, I but I did note it when it, when it po cropped up, you right. know, um, uh, yeah, it's definitely yeah, a part I, of his his style. For sure, for sure. But of course, the big thing, the big thing that I think is can be said to be a part of his style is his use of violence. Um, right. You know, I I think that violence, you can't really talk about violence as just sort of one thing across movies, um, because. Uh, of course, unless it's a really bad movie, in a lot of instances, it's not. It's not actually violence. It's the it's the representation or the sort of mimicry or the pretendness of violence. Uh -huh. And so, it's 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 another way to another way to say that is that it's the work of an artist, right? So there's there's a there's a a style that you can begin to speak of in the way that violence is done. Mm -hmm. And maybe if you don't see a lot of violent films you just sort of look at it all as one thing. But if you've seen as many horror films as I have, you <laughs> begin to note, you know, that there are distinctions uh, to be made. And so I think that you can talk about Mel Gibson um, as having a sort of aesthetic of, of violence mm -hmm. and having one that is his own. Um, I think that when you watch a film like Braveheart, when you watch a film like Apocalypto, certainly when you watch The Passion, um, the violence is it's not an accidental thing. It's, it's definitely a part of, uh, the, it has to be taken as a part of the whole. Um, and here, yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely the case. We're talking about a violent culture. Right. Um, and so how that's depicted is going to be an important question that the artist has to, to address. Um, and so we've already talked about how I think in general, there is a commitment to, to realism. And so I think that there is a certain, a certain realism in the violence here, uh, as there is in, in, in the passion, you know, that's one of the things that makes the, the film remarkable. Um, so if I could say like, uh, for instance, uh, there is the use of the blunt weapons, um, in the scene when they're, the, the city is being attacked or the, the, the village is being attacked. Yeah. You know, that's conveyed really, um, you know, if not graphically, uh, convincingly, you know, through right. the sounds and through how we see the we the the weapons being 
uh, wielded. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's also, uh, certainly very, very graphic as well. I think that there's like, it's, it's an R rated film. Um, uh, but that isn't to say that it's gratuitous or, or, you know, excessive. Um, so again, I think that, that he's, he's, there's a commitment to realism, but it's also, it's also tasteful. Um, so there, you know, on the whole, I, I would say that it never really veers into a kind of like, uh, exhibitionist, uh, uh, yeah. sort of wallowing in it. Um, the only part where I felt it might've been, uh, is when, uh, the nemesis, uh, of the main character finally gets killed. Yeah. Um, because that's one of the few places where it feels like it's like sort of lingering on it in a certain way. Maybe, I mean, it's definitely a kind of like a, a, a moment that's intended to sort of like wow you with the kind of the blood squirting out of the side guy the side right, of the guy's right. head. Well, I mean, I um, think that you could you could say one that the um, the commitment to realism is still there, right. right? So so the spurting is of course happening from the 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 blood that's being pumped from the heart, right. and hearts incidentally are a pretty important part of this film yeah. um, and the way that they function. Um, we see. Uh, beating hearts in hands, you know, right. um, and and all of that. Uh, just a quick aside: all of that has to be rendered very meticulously by an artist. You know, someone had to sculpt that model and then dress it with uh, fake blood, and then uh -huh. also I I insert the mechanism that was going to make it to, to to be able to beat, you know, and and be yeah. handled. And all of this stuff is very fascinating, and so you can't take any of it for granted. Is part of part of why I'm spending so much time talking about it is sure. that um, I think that that the, that things are communicated through the violence and that Mel Gibson is a very outstanding example of this. And so uh, what I was going to say in connection to this instance that you're talking about is that, um, you know, you can talk about the the commitment to realism, but there's not just that, of course, right? right. This isn't just about realism. And so there is also, uh, you know, a, 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 uh, a dramatic consideration. So, you know, things are done for dramatic effect as I think they are done here because mm -hmm. we're stretching out this moment, this final sort of victory of the culture of life over the culture of death. Um, yeah. uh, but then also there's a poetic um, significance. Now, I don't know um, if I uh, have, have a sort of poetic... Um, uh, interpretation of this moment or or specifically of the the, the spurting there but mm -hmm. i do think that you can talk about a certain poetics of the violence in general um you know so uh some examples that come to mind are with uh well well one one really interesting uh contrast is between the father uh zero wolf when he attends to this wound that his son has at, 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 at this moment in the film where we don't even know that this is his son mm -hmm. uh, because he's right. He, that hasn't been introduced and he's really just treating him like any one of the other soldiers. Right. Uh, but he says, yeah, you forgot to duck. His son has a, a big swollen eye. And what does he do? He, he holds him uh, uh, despite the fact that his, his son sort of pulls away in, in, in fear, you know, he says, no, but you know, he, he grabs him and, and, and bleeds the wound so that his son can can see. Yeah. And so right there in that we have communicated sort of the pragmatism of this this people. Um right. We have communicated uh the sort of uh the brutality or the sort of the violence of the intervention. Um and then later there's something to be said about this father son relationship, you know, right. because we, we, we realize, Oh, that's his son, you know? Right. Uh, but then very shortly after that, we get a scene of the mother, uh, stitching the wound of her, 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 you know, like eight year old son or something, um, using the heads of these ants, uh, that is <laughs> so crazy. It is crazy. Um, and, uh, and also very graphic, you know, because yeah. we get a close in shot of the 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 ants, you know, biting into this wound, um, right. you know, just as the 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 slitting of the eye was very graphic too. I mean, yeah, and very amazingly rendered. You know, someone had to go in there with the the uh, you know whatever latex uh, uh, yeah. adhesive, and you know, but um, 
I kind of dork out on this because I, I just I, I find the, uh-huh. the 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 task so interesting. Like, hmm, what would it look like? <laughs> um, you know, um, but uh, but but yeah, of course, with the the mother and the son there, we have a very different picture of, um, you know, how to use, uh, you know, how to make use of nature to heal, um, uh, you know, and and also of of her interaction with her son. You know, it's very loving, um, it's very gentle, you know, and the way that she deals with his fear, um, uh, the way that she sort of encourages him to 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 uh brave to be brave in this moment you know is very different from what we get from the father and the son there so i'm going on for a long time here to say that um that these moments are more than just like oh gross look at that you know like something something is being conveyed um Mm -hmm. uh right you know the first the first violent thing we see is when they're divvying up the the boar that they've been hunting um and so yeah uh, it's um tapir Tapir, yeah, that's right, that's right. So that's the first, you know, heart that we see out in somebody's hand. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but it's, you know, it's it's an important sort of first introduction to this is the world. This is the world that we live in. It's a it's a bloody world. It's right. a violent world. Um, but that isn't to say that it's necessarily a wicked one. We're gonna see what wicked violence looks like. We're gonna see right. how that's different. You know. Um, yeah. And uh, good point. yeah, yeah. And then also the way that. Yeah. Uh, it's not just in the way that the violence is rendered, um, so like in the magic trick of the the effects itself, but it's also in the way that the camera is used, um, you know, and sort of the relationship that the camera has to the violence. Um, so a uh, a good example, I think, is during the human sacrifice sequence. Um, you know, you can you can think of a lot of different ways of of filming that and of dealing with that. Um, and some of them are going to be more brutal than others. Um, and when I say brutal, I don't necessarily mean, again, explicit or gratuitous. Um, that could be one way that you you sort of do a really brutal uh, uh, rendition of this. Um, and Mel Gibson doesn't shy away from showing it, you know. But again, it's not it's not like it's it's a spectacle and super gratuitous and like in your face. Yeah. Well, I did um, find myself um, surprised by how restrained he often was in many of the yeah. moments. I mean, there's a lot more violent moments that aren't handled as graphically than the ones that are handled graphically. Well, but I uh, that's why I wanted to make a, another point about how violence is is conveyed with the camera and how brutality is, is sort of how, how, how the, how the violence affects us. Yeah. So, um, uh, in this moment, uh, when the second person is brought up to be sacrificed, so we've already had the sort of establishing shot of the right. action itself. Now we see things a little bit more from the perspective of the person being sacrificed. Right. So we get a, a shot, a cut to his face as yeah. he sees his heart being held up in front of right. him. And that, that's a shot that we don't get with the first person who sacrificed. And so we also get a point of view shot from his head. That's already been. <laughs> cut yes, <off>. yes, <laughs> totally, totally. But you know, be, uh, there is some speculation about this, about uh, the amount of time between a decapitation and your sort of loss of, uh-huh. of, of, of all consciousness, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, so there's there's like a real um yeah this this point of view uh the the violence lands differently when it's being handled sensitively like this you know when there are these cinematic gestures that are being given to us to sort of now identify us more with the victim right um and and that that's the same too with 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 all all the the commitment to realism and to the sound effects and uh you know, in a world where the violence, where we believe that the violence is realistic, that is going to change the way, the effect that the violence has on us as spectators too, the way that it lands, you know, Um, even if, because at the end of the day, of course, it's not real. It's very stylized. That's all that it is. It's an elaborate magic trick, but, but the way that it's executed from one film to another is so different and speaks of so much artistic sensibility, you know, that, that 
it really, you know, it's it's a disservice to just sort of cavalierly dismiss it as so many like blood and guts. Um, and so I think that that if you look at Mel Gibson's films, uh, you know, in general, that you can sort of track this this um, this ability that he has to to paint with these strokes of of violence and mm-hmm. in so doing to to really convey a lot. Um, yeah. If you get interrupted in a minute, is there any chance you'll be able to come back and do another 10 minutes or something? Um, yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, there's also uh, quite a bit of, I think the term I've seen used is like ethnographic nudity uh, in in the film. I Quite quite a bit maybe is, is too much of a uh, too strong way of putting it. I, th- I would say it's, it's r- fairly uh, sensitively, fairly tastefully handled. It probably could have been handled with even a little bit more discretion than it was. Um, because, because the women are generally wearing things, but they kind of like shift to the side and stuff. So it wouldn't have been unrealistic if he had just handled it in a way that we never saw any of the nudity, you know what I mean? Um, because it just wasn't shot from certain angles or whatever, but it's not, it's never exploitative. And that actually plays into some of the upsetting violent moments in the film as well, because when women are being hauled away, uh, on the way to the village, we're, we're, not, we're not seeing any, you know, actual sexual acts or anything. But when a woman, a woman is being dragged away uh, by her legs or whatever, um, and she is, you know, topless, <laughs> it's yeah. it's it's more upsetting. It's more visceral. Right. You know, it plays right. into the you know, and they don't need to actually show anything more than that, you know, for it to be right. very upsetting. And of course, we're also seeing the reaction of you know, the women's husbands who are seeing this, who are being, who are tied up or yeah. things like that. It's quite hard to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good yeah. point. Yeah. Cause um, there's, there's a similar scene in one of the early Mad Max films um, in terms of, you know, a, 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 a kind of an explicit uh, depiction of, of, of sexual assault. Right. Um, and, and a similar topless uh, uh, actress. Um, and that was like really, wounding well it's an actual rape scene in that yeah right to that film that yeah that's that's a good distinction but but even just the um even if it the thing that i'm honing in on is is sort of the the use of nudity because um uh in that mad max example that that was like very wounding to me and my heart and my conscience um right uh but i didn't even it didn't even occur to me the the, the connection, you know, here in the in in Apocalypto. Right. Well, it's because they're already it's right. not that much of a change from the way that they're already dressed. Yes, exactly, they're, you know, exactly. the clothing is going askew a little bit. But right. Um, but the camera, the camera isn't really it's not it's not like a voyeuristic or a prurient no. thing, you know, no. um, whereas in Mad Max, I think in Mad Max, he's literally looking through a telescope. Right. As right, this is happening. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so. So, you know. Yeah, like enough said, but uh, another, uh, you know, interesting note about how how the body is employed, you know, in cinema. And then there's a bit of there's a bit of that's the film surprisingly starts with, you know, ribaldry, (laughs) which is not what I would have expected. The scene where this practical joke is being being played on the guy because he he has to (laughs) eat the uh, they tell him he has to eat the testicles of the animal that they've just killed because he's having trouble having children basically um and then it turns out it's just a big prank and then there's another layer to the prank uh which maybe i won't get into it (laughs) explicitly i felt maybe that was a bit excessive that that scene because the guy is running running out and he's naked and he's just covering his crotch with his hands you know um yeah but but it is also it is also um even even so, it's it's not modest, but even so, even the context of it is, um, it's it's uh, they're being mean to him, but but he's married. You, you know what I mean? Like it's it's it doesn't it's not like any right. number of crude jokes in other movies. Right. It's right, it feels right. more like this is what it would be like in a tribe of people. Yeah, of earthy yeah, and, people living up and living out in the woods. Yeah, I mean, um, it, it it says some things about this this community. Um, yeah, you know that uh, uh, tells that chil- the, the chief of the tribe is not just this dispenser right. of wisdom. You really, I really bought into the fact that he was giving him doing totally, him a favor. Totally, totally, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, it's also that children are a good thing. You know that this this the, this 
people wants more children um that right. uh totally you know that men are fathers here you know and that's a big part of their it's central to their identity right. um that uh that yeah that there's a sense of humor um there's not a then, lot of privacy it's a very close net <laughs> that's right that's right Try. um and and also you know a sense that this humor that this this pranking is also somehow it it has a utility in that it uh it bonds them you know um mm -hmm. like when 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 they have the the prank with the 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 tapers uh testicles um you know immediately afterward uh the guy's all right you know and he even sort of like fakes like a punch toward jaguar right. paw who who responds in fear and they all laugh about it you know now, it so is this... kind of mean in the context that he's having totally. trouble having kids and his, his not, mother in law is saying that it's not mean him. i'm not saying that it's not mean but yeah. i'm saying that there is yeah. a social function here right um in that there there is like a a sense of like well can you take this we do say this? that we do see it's more there's not hatred in it right and yeah. he's also he's a big guy he's right. he's a he's a, a he's the biggest of them yeah right and so maybe there's like a sense in which he needs to be sort of kept in check socially you know um <laughs> uh, interesting uh but but yeah i just i'm because I'm, I'm a big believer in humor being a good thing obviously we all are uh maybe not all of us um but but actually like the kind of um the ribbing that 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 the guys will do on on each other you know right. like i think that this is actually like a fruitful it has a fruitful uh right uh, social function you know mm -hmm. but also it draws us in to the film so that we front load all yes. this humor very much um, so yeah with the mother-in-law giving them a hard time and everybody's yeah. laughing about it you know the audience buys in too um which is going to be an important thing totally. when you're about to put them through a lot of you know violence and horror right 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 yeah. right um okay a few th a few more things we can talk about my only real complaint about the film is I think it was excessively, maybe a little too much to have his wife giving birth in the pit <laughs> when they're in danger of drowning. I feel like that was just like one too many layers. Dude, I on thought the cake. that was awesome. I, I think it's cool because, uh, you know, we get all this time given to how, how awesome this father is, you know, uh -huh. and how much he has to go through. But I think that, you know, yeah, this 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 mother is really awesome too. You know, she's got her one child up on her back, the other child she's given birth to and then holding holding in the other arm, you know, and she's standing on this rock to keep their heads above water, you know. Yeah, okay. It's it's <laughs> it's it's a lot, but um but I I thought it was There's great. a point there's a point at which like it becomes an element that I, I'm no longer buying into or like moved by. Let's <laughs> raise the stakes even a little bit more is like yeah. something that I that I'm not feeling it like yeah, they want me to. Although I will um, say I will say that you know uh they they handle it um pretty uh uh pretty sophisticatedly with how they introduce new elements into this cave. So, for instance, like the rock that she ends up standing on to to keep their heads above water, that was the rock that was thrown down. Oh, good point. To them, I didn't think you know? of that. Or you know the um the thing that she uses to to try to to try to club um this monkey that's fallen down, right. uh, which ostensibly becomes something that they they survive right. off of. You right. Know? Right. Right. Um, uh, is the the you know stalactite or whatever they're called uh, that's yeah, broken yeah. off by that rock when it's thrown right. down? You know, so so she's she's using things at hand in a way that that the film justifies. Yes. Um, uh, so and there's like so a you, sense of resourcefulness. Yeah. So you, they, know, you know they've at least tried to do that. That we also you know? see in. Uh, <laughs> it's so interesting. Well, I mean, the guy's name is Jaguar Paw, and when he finally gets back to the jungle, the first thing that helps him out is this jaguar. Which starts chasing him, but then ends up mauling one of the guys who are oh chasing my gosh. him. That, and there's that, the, the little girl you scene. mentioned earlier. She's there's this sort of prophecy that involves some of these elements that him he's going to fall and be reborn from the mud and earth, and he falls into sort of like I don't know if it's quicksand technically or what, but yeah. he comes back out of it. But at a certain point, once he gets back into his territory, it's all almost got this mystical quality of like all of the jungle creatures 
helping him totally. like the bees and and it and it fits in with that story again that the old man told about man getting these all these abilities from the different animals right you know right. and how he use makes the poison darts from the poisonous toad and yeah. all that stuff so it becomes really fun to see all of the, <laughs> how resourceful yeah. he is well and it's it's his yeah. forest you know right. it's it's where his fathers have lived and it's where his sons will hunt after he is but gone but it takes on this mystical and mythic quality where he's able to run all day and all night and it's this yeah. like legendary chase and and right. you know all these different animals and yeah uh so yeah it has this it has this yeah. great quality it's just a it. good movie you know right it's like a good good old movie <laughs> yeah um we should talk about the ending because that's one of the debated points among people who yes. appreciate or don't appreciate this film and the ending big spoiler it's such a great moment um is the first contact with the Spanish. Um, and it's, it's again, very restrained, but basically at the end of this chase, he and his two remaining pursuers reach the so shore and the chase is over because something much bigger is about to happen, which is that they see these ships coming in and then they see the boats ro yeah. rowing in from the ships with these, uh, these Spaniards, we see a big a Franciscan friar holding a big cross, you know, these guys coming in and, uh, and we don't see what they do or there's no actual communication between them or anything like that. But it's kind of that, that tag of, you know, the civilization, the, 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 not that these are conquistadors we're seeing, but that this is the, the harbinger of that conquest from without that's mentioned in the quote right. from the, the film. Now, people have complained uh, that this film is taking this triumphalistic attitude where now the Spanish Christians are here to save everybody, you know. And, um, well, first of all, in the case of the Aztecs, as it actually happened, I mean, there is some validity to seeing it that way. I wouldn't necessarily complain about a movie that portrayed it that way, at least in part. Sure. Um, but I don't really think he's doing a triumphalistic thing. I mean, for one thing... Uh, when his uh, Jaguar Pa's wife asks, should we go to them and meet them? And he says, no, let's go <laughs> further into the forest yeah. and seek a new beginning. He's yeah. like, I don't know about this. This doesn't seem like it's necessarily well, good news for me. Um, yeah, what is, what the fact she that it first? saves his life perhaps is incidental, you mm -hmm. know? Um, yeah, what she, what she says, what are they? And he yeah. says, they bring men. Referring to the ships, yeah. Yeah, he says, they bring men. And 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 I think that just in those three words, they bring men. Just just all this loaded meaning, <laughs> right? That, car that carries with it, you know. Yes. Um, uh, and and you don't get the sense that he's naive, you know, like that to to, to that meaning, you know, that that he he's just had an experience of of men, you know, of of sophisticated men, um, right? right. And yeah, and so so he's able to see this. And and sort of have a yeah a little more wisdom, you know, more prudence, uh, to to remain self sufficient to go to the forest and seek a new beginning, you know. And and, and um, even someone like me who knowing the story of the Aztecs, although this movie is not about Aztecs, might be disposed to cheer when oh human no more human sacrifice or something like that. Yeah, that's not the feeling I got when seeing this. Yeah, the feeling you get is like. It's like, oh boy. Yeah, totally. It's just like, totally, oh man, totally. a whole big yeah. change is coming. Right. You know, right, and it's just right. more just the weight of the moment than like cheering it or being against it. It's just like the just the gravity of the, yeah. the moment that you feel. I think it's I think it's an amazing moment. Um yeah. it's really well executed. It pays off in a big way. Um, because it's the you know, you know, we get that slight mention at the beginning with the quote. Um, it's not even an explicit mention, but it's just a sort of, uh, you know, inference. And then yeah. we largely forget about the Spanish for yeah. the whole film, you know, because they have nothing to do with this. Right. Uh, and so so when they reemerge, it it, catch, it catches us by surprise as, almost as much as it does them, you know? Yeah. And, and what so, do we say is that they, they stop fighting them amongst themselves. They, they're not exactly allying together against the Spanish right. or anything they're like just that. Sort of, but they, just bigger concerns have taken place. Right. They don't know yeah. what they're looking at, yeah. you know? Um, and uh, it's it's an awesome reveal because we, we see their response first, yeah. the reaction. And then the and camera And this kind of like around. is the, apocal the apocalypse 
of right. the you know uh the 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 uh the word referring to a new beginning or an unveiling a kind of revelation you know um That's right. this is something that i think richard hansen talks about in his in his essay um and he also talks about um i mean the fact that mel gibson sees the the mayans as more symbolic of our civilization i think should make us realize it's not like a triumphalistic right. take either you right. know Right. Um, but but Richard Hansen in his essay, I want to read when he discusses the ending, he says, in reality, the Spanish arrival to collect supplies represented a future devastating blow to the Maya, not their salvation. And Gibson and Farhad, the co-writer of the film, were fully aware of this. In reality, in addition to a metaphorical new beginning, that segment was designed to provide an avenue for a future sequel, <laughs> should it be desired. Um uh -huh. And to explain the separation of Yucatecan speakers into the interior forest to form the Lacandon societies in the Sierras of northwestern Guatemala, Guatemala and Chiapas, which would have occurred around this time. So that's interesting yeah. as well. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Do you have anything more to say about this? Um, I guess only that to 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 underline further. Um, this theme of, of, of a depiction of a portrait of a culture of death. Um, you just, you see it sort of throughout. Um, there is a moment of, of euthanasia or, or not quite. There's a guy who's, who's dying. And uh, the advice that's given to him is to, to basically open his veins. It's going to be quicker. Right. You know? And so, so you, you see in that and in some other instances where, where people are very disposable, even, yeah, even uh, you know someone that that's been with you this whole time uh, at the at the waterfall, Zero Wolf uh, throws one of his one of his people over. Right. Um, uh, you know it's it's you you see how um, the effects that a culture of death produces in the way that you treat others, even your own kind, and right. um, and I think that that's you know that's it's 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 an important observation because. You just can't have an institution like large scale human sacrifice and not have it affect, you know, all this other stuff about how you're going to be interacting with your your coworkers, with your son, with, you know, prisoners or the poor or whatever. And, right. And so it's it's worth saying, you know, in connection to abortion that this is not like an isolated problem. Right. You you can't have an institution like abortion and not have that just profoundly impact the way that that uh uh in, in you know humans are treated just right across the the spectrum yeah right 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 yeah, yeah. i i think that also uh, an interesting way that it's illustrated too is is how zero wolf dies at the end he's caught in a trap like an animal he's mm -hmm. he's he's tricked you know um he's he's killed using the exact same uh, device that was used to hunt this tapir at the beginning, right? And and so his his violence, his need for revenge, his uh, dehumanization of other people, you know, um, this culture of death that he represents, it makes him predictable and conquerable, like an animal, you know. Right. So there's this dehumanizing effect on ourselves as well. Right. Again, referencing that that quote at the beginning about a great civilization isn't able to be conquered from without mm -hmm. until it, it destroys itself from within. Okay, well, uh, that was Apocalypto. And uh, let us know what you think in the comments. Let us know what you think of James's analysis of movie violence. You know, what I, what I think we should do uh, sometime is watch a movie that we would consider to be a bad example of movie violence. Because, okay. because you know, whenever you see... Uh, church statements about films, they always talk about bad depictions of sexuality and violence together. And yet it's a lot easier to, to put the finger on bad depictions of sexuality. Um, I mean, if you get into the horror genre, maybe it's, it's easier to find bad depictions of violence, but in, in a movie in, in, in the types of movies I watch, yeah, I should say uh, that I, I, I find it, harder to find, you know, depictions of violence where I'm certain this is wrong, sure. you know? Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> maybe we should sometime watch one of the John Wick movies or something, <laughs> which is an example I would consider to be a bad 
right. approach to violence. Right. Um, and uh, I don't know. It would be interesting to to try to take a crit- critical look at that because uh, insofar as the church brings this up as a problem, we should be able to find some way of like diagnosing it. And maybe we could start with like a an easier to diagnose case to try to like learn how to make these distinctions and, yeah. and be objective yeah. about it. Totally. Totally. Um, yeah, yeah, but, you know, it, yeah. I think it's I think it's tricky um, in a similar way that the the nudity stuff is tricky um, because in a lot of instances I've been at this, this a long film time in particular. No, no, no. I think in in general, violence in film in general. Um, I've been at this a long time, and I think that it really comes down for me personally. It's a gut check, um, you know, uh, that you know it when you see it, you know. Right. Um, and, but we uh, watch a lot more movies with violence that we would defend than movies with nudity that we would defend. There's far fewer right. cases of nudity in films that I would defend. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that just speaks to the very different, uh, very important distinctions between real nudity and pretend violence, you know? Right, um, right, right, so, right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but the, you know, the ancient Greeks... Uh, doesn't the word obscene actually we use it to refer to sexual things more often but doesn't the word obscene actually refer in addition uh, to to the way that they would do violence off stage hmm. in Greek plays huh. I know that's the origin of it of the word interesting like it literally means like off scene yeah well um, yeah 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 interesting yeah we talk about things in film being visceral and uh, that's another <laughs> another interesting <laughs> right. word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We should talk about some viscera. Okay. Well, maybe we'll do. Maybe we'll follow up on this topic of violence uh, in the future because I think this is the most technically the most violent film that we've discussed so far, isn't it? Probably. Probably. Everybody, thanks for listening. Um, maybe check out CatholicCulture.org if you haven't been there before. We have a lot of great Catholic resources, uh, articles, news, information for how to live the liturgical year. You can obviously keep up with all of our podcasts, but consider signing up to one of our email newsletters because then you got you get everything from uh, all the highlights from any given week of CatholicCulture.org material funneled into uh, just two, e- two emails a week, um, and uh, you can keep abreast of everything in one place that way. Uh, yeah, so it's a great way. Cult- yeah. Sorry, it's a great way of not just being tuned into the work that we're doing, but also just into the sort of Catholic world in general, you know. Right. Yep. All right, everybody. See you next time. Criteria is a production of CatholicCulture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Way of the Fathers, an early church history podcast hosted by Mike Aquilina, Catholic Culture audiobooks bringing to life classic Catholic writings, and the Catholic Culture Podcast, an interview show exploring Catholic arts, culture, and issues. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical year resources, and much more at CatholicCulture.org.